from Thursday. We've been talking about, do you have one of those resurrection life? Okay. I think, I think one of the things I, I did make mention of, because most of the time now people have made resurrection an event when it was never an event, it was a person. And if you try to make an event, then you're waiting to live. You, you, if you got life, you can only have one kind of life in God as a resurrected life. That spirit be in you, that was in him, it's going to do what? It's going to raise you up. So uh, trying to get that across to people sometimes is, is, is part of the reason our faith don't work is because we still are waiting to be raised when God has already raised you up to sit with him now in heavenly places. Again, another scripture that really got me because I hear people all the time trying to say they're not blessed. But let me just tell you this here. The Bible says he has already blessed you with all, everybody said all, spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Right. Now, if you haven't been raised to sit with him in heavenly places, then you are not recognizing all the blessings that he has given you that can only be extracted from heavenly places. Now, I, 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 don't get me wrong. One thing I like about us, we do have, look like a dual citizenship. We're citizens of earth, but greater than citizens of earth, we are citizens of heaven. That means we have all the rights that heaven can afford unto us. Again, heaven is not just a place you're going to go to. Heaven is a place where you live in. It is a, an arena where we exercise the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. And the influence of God is what determines where you live in your life. Whatever God influences is his kingdom. That's why you can't get caught up in the kingdom of man. You got to understand the kingdom of God is different than the kingdom of man. God doesn't need man to build his kingdom. God has built his kingdom and need man to come into his kingdom. Part of being saved is transferring, leaving the kingdom of darkness and coming into the kingdom of light. But now I need to understand what light, because wherever there's light, you got to also incorporate what life. If you don't have life, you don't have light. And so all these things, we need to put the dots together, pull it together and Quit trying to make this life so complicated because really it's very simple. Jesus said it was simple. I believe it was simple. I made it complex like you made it complex. And part of the reason why it's so complex for us because I had a hard time believing it. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I, I, I had a hard time believing what God said because I'm looking at what I see. But the Bible tells us the just by what? Faith. By faith. Not by sight, but by faith. Now, I ain't going to ask you. I don't want you to respond. How many of you think you're living by faith or you're living by sight? Now, you ain't got to answer me. You just need to answer yourself. Is it sight that gets you or is it faith that got you? Because most of the thing we're disturbed by is what we see. All right? Nothing bothers us more than the external thing because there's something about us. We never ever feel threatened if we don't pray. If we don't study. If we don't seek spirit. We, we never feel threatened by that, but let something external. Man, you want to see people back up like a Louisiana crawdad? <laughs> Let something external get in their way and they don't understand the faith is way beyond what you're seeing. And if you'll get your eyes off of what you think you see, 
looking unto Jesus. Oh boy, y'all got some words. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> y'all got that word today, ain't you? Looking unto Jesus, who is. So, who you think started your faith? And you're trying to finish it. Huh? Aren't you? Yeah, yeah, you're trying to finish it, but the Bible didn't say you would. Huh? The last I read, he started it, and he's the only one that can finish it. Because you know why? You don't even know how. The Bible becomes so plain, it says, Brother Thornton, you don't even know what to pray for. Hmm? And yet we'll get up and brag about how we prayed, and you don't even know what to pray for. <laughs> when I prayed, I prayed. But the Bible says you don't, you don't even know what to pray for. But your Heavenly Father knows what you have need of. And matter of fact, even when you don't know what to pray, if you allow him to pray to you, he'll pray the answer for you. Because he began this walk with you. And he's going to end this walk with you. Like I said, some of us are going to go crying and have our hand in the sand and concrete as he drags us along, but we're still coming along. <laughs> You're going to be hollering and crying, oh God, no, no. But see, the, our Father knows what he, we have need of before we even ask. My thing is not looking at what I think I need, but looking unto him who is the author and finisher of my faith because I know what he's going to do for me is going to be better than what I could ever do for myself. If I thought I could do it for myself, I don't need him at all. Right? Well, God, we, we like to put faith on things that we can accomplish. A lot of times, a lot of things we blame in our, our are uh, giving Jesus credit for, it's not even him involved. He don't even care. You know, God bless me with a box of Cheerios. He don't care if you eat Cheerios or cornflakes. <laughs> That's your own personal choice. <laughs> he could care less what you had for breakfast this morning. But, you know, I'm not saying that God didn't bless you. Yes, you're already blessed. You're blessed with, if you're eating pig feet. You're still blessed, okay? But I think sometimes because of our sights have been so low when it comes to God. It's been so low. We don't expect God to do too much, even though he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere. And, and uh, the awesomeness of God is that we, we like the thought of that, but we really don't want to be put in that position where we can see the awesomeness of God. Flesh has to die to see it. Mostly every time God brought a man to a place of real faith, there was almost a death involved. Every time. Sometimes we, we, we're more uh, harder on ourselves than God is hard on us. Number one, it, you know, it's just like me being a dad and uh, raising my kids. And I know if you raise kids, you know they get about four or five, so they're doing all kind of little crazy things, and you just wonder, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> Don't you know better? No, they didn't. Because you know why? They have never had your experience to know what you know. Okay? So here's God. We'll come to God, we'll beat ourselves up because we think we know as much as God knows. <laughs> you don't know as much as God knows no more than your kids knew what you knew at the time you had through your kid. And so what does God do? Same thing you done with your kids. Did you throw your kids out? Hmm? Did you break their arm? Did you inflict them with cancer? You didn't break their leg? Why? Well, 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 why is it then when it comes to God is all of a sudden is that we have this whole concept about God. Well, you know, 
I'm beating myself up because I know better. If you knew better, you're going to do better. <laughs> if you don't know better, you can't do no better than what you know. That's the reason why in walking with God, you need to realize one thing. You can't walk no farther than God than what God is able to reveal to you to walk in. All right, you may have a trail, you may have your little paved highway over here, but he may not have you on a paved highway. He may have you on a wilderness road where ain't no paved highways and no sign. That's God's way. But a lot of times we got our own way. We want to put Jesus' name on our way and, and say that it's his way when it never was his way. Ever. A lot of things today, we have made it, put it, and said, this is what God likes, this is what God wants. I told you, I don't think anyone's any more, was any more judgmental than I was when it came to religious stuff. I'm straight up honest with you. I mean, when I first started, that was certain things. <laughs> you couldn't have a mustache. No. If you preach with me, you ain't gonna have no mustache. You ain't gonna have no. no I, I didn't get into Shell Sleeve stuff too much unless I went to Texas. And the reason I did that is one of the things we need to realize. A lot of times Christians don't understand. It takes a wise man not to offend people. Okay. And a lot of times it's that when Paul said, I become all things to all men. Because if you offend a brother, you can't win it. You're not going to win someone you offended. So was I going to lose anything because I put the long sleeve shirt on and went to Texas? I knew what they expected down there. If I'm going to reach them, I, I believe my word that I was bringing was a lot greater than what I had, had on. So if it took me putting on a long sleeve shirt to preach the word of God, I'll preach the word of God. You know, if, if, if someone told me if I was going to go over there and, and, uh, and win some Hindu guys, and they wouldn't hear me unless I had on one of them little whatever they got, the little gown robe, I'd put the little gown and robe on. Why? Because my message is greater than the package. Huh? A lot of times we're afraid, no, I, I ain't putting it on. I ain't, no, I ain't. I, I want to win it. Do I lose salvation because I put on that little sorry or whatever the thing they call it? <laughs> what is it? Oh, I'm sorry then. Not the women thing. <laughs> the sorry thing. What? The, the sorry was the woman's thing. Well, anyway, the road. But sometimes we're so here, up here, where we think we are, and really God is trying to get you down here where the blessings are. Blessings have always flowed down. That's why the Bible says he giveth more grace to the who? Yeah, and he resists because a proud person believes they're in a place where they're not. Right? You, you talk to a person, he got pride, you can be sure he's looking down on somebody because he can't be up there unless somebody's down below him. The church that was built like that. The church was built with Jesus Christ on the bottom. They did not say no greater foundation than this that can be laid, that was laid. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, apostles and prophets, the foundation, layers. And so it's not, if I'm considering myself great, then my job as a great man of God is to be pushing you up higher. Because the blessing, I get more blessed because of that. Why? Because the blessings of God is always flowing down. Everybody's trying to get to the top. Only to find out that the kingdom of God ain't built like a pyramid. <laughs> That's a Babylonian system. Because the one thing about I found out about the Babylonian system, the higher you go up, the less power you really have. Your anointing dries up real quick in thin air. You, ain't gonna, you won't have the oil that you used to have to cost you too high. Let no man think more highly of himself than he is. 
How many of y'all think you're better than somebody? You know, of course you ain't going to say it. I, I don't think I'm better than anybody. No, I, you know, I don't think I'm better than anybody, but I'll tell you what, I ain't less than anybody. You know, keep it balanced. You're not better than me. I'm not better than you. But I'm not lesser than you either. And, you know, when we look at the life of Christ, we realize when he came, he just blows my mind some of the things they say about him as he came. Because if anybody had a right to have a proudful attitude, it would have been him. You know, Mr. Know It All. <laughs> That's what some of the first he thought about it. <laughs> you think you know so much? You think you know more than Moses know? You think you know more than my father know? <laughs> hey, before Moses was. I am Mr. Know-it-all. <laughs> so let's read real quickly. Romans chapter 10. Again, we'll forge ahead and try to make a little inroads. Because I, I, I really believe we missed so much when it came to faith because we made faith more like fantasy than a, re a reality. We, we forgot really what faith is versus what we have called it. We've made a denomination. Faith, you know, what, what faith are you? There ain't but one faith you can be. <laughs> There's only one person you can have faith in. And, but now we made faith into a denomination. What faith are you? Well, I'm Baptist, okay? That's not faith. Well, I'm apostolic, that's not faith. Well, I'm Catholic. That's not faith. Faith is not a denomination. Faith is not an organization. Faith is a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship, you really are not operating in the real faith of God. Matter, I think I made mention last week. Many people struggle today, say they don't have faith. Then, you, then you're trying to make God a lot. There's not one person born of God that don't have faith. The moment you got the Holy Ghost, you got the spirit of faith. If you operate in that spirit, you'll always operate in faith. It's only when we don't operate in that spirit that we don't operate in faith. It's the spirit of faith. You can't have the spirit of Jesus without having a spirit of faith. As same spirit of him said, I do always those things I see my father do. Part of the reason why we don't see what we need to see is because we're not, we're looking at the wrong daddy. Huh? We got to look at the right daddy. God will not mislead you. But you will mislead yourself. Because if you're trying to bear the image of the first Adam and try to make that first Adam image be the image that God wants, then you have aborted the real faith that he wanted to give you. What do you mean, Brother Wilson? It's real simple. A lot of times we're so in tune with our flesh that we don't understand what the spirit is. We know what the flesh is. I lived in this house for 60 some years now. I know it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, now I know the difference between him and Jesus. All right, they ain't the same. Jesus can come and live in here, but I can put him in the in the basement and lock him up so I can keep living out of here. And most of the things I say today that bothers us is more about flesh and his spirit. There is no failure in his spirit. You can't fail in his spirit. But you can fail in your flesh. And every time you lean yourself to it, you're going to fail in it because it was not made to accomplish nothing. All right? Oh, praise God. So we read, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Where is it at? In your mouth? You better make sure. Because what comes out your mouth does have consequences. All right? A lot of things that we say today, just because you spoke it out your mouth, it didn't come from your heart. I think I may mention what we say, God is good all the time. 
You ain't been, you ain't been through all time yet, though, have Because them same people tell me God's good all the time. He's never that good on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday. He's just good on Sunday. He said, but the word is even in thy mouth, in thy heart. This is the word of faith, word of faith that we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth, with the heart man believeth, yeah, not with the brain, not with your intellect. Sometimes we can fool ourselves by intellectually agreeing and accepting things, but he said with the heart, because eventually your heart is going to tell the whole story. I can tell myself in my brain I trust God. But there come a time in your life, in my life, when the heart is going to tell the real story. Yeah. It's like Job. I mean, with his head, you know what? I bet you he was thinking, man, because he was trying hard, hating evil, everything. But see, you don't know how much you trust God until you have to trust God. Yeah. All right? Now, kids, he had kids, and family, and camels, and cows. Man, it's, hard. it's, it's easy to get up and testify. Woo! God is good all the time. Ah! And then the Bible makes this statement. And there came a day. <laughs> that statement. And there came a day. All of a sudden his head ain't working right. Because that day came, kids died, lost everything, wife talking crazy. He'd been inflicted with boils. There came a day. All of a sudden, it's not your head no more. Now I got to figure out what I believe in my heart. All of a sudden, you know what Job said? Man, I wish my mama would have smothered me when I came out the room. I wish I would just die. You know why he was saying that? Because it wasn't in his heart like he thought it was. You don't know what's in your heart until you've been squeezed. Yeah, everybody can say them good things when good things are happening, but we got a God that weighs up everything. He don't just give me good things. He allows other things to balance out my good things so like he told Paul because in abundance of your revelation I, I sent you a thorn. Now why would he do that? Why would God send a person a thorn and you're doing a good thing? Why would he do that? Because he wants to keep you balanced. You know how many of y'all gave your kids, gave your kids candy every day. Yeah, I don't know what they do now, but they, when I grew up, candy only came on Easter and Christmas. <laughs> and I was glad to get that bag because we didn't have candy like they do now. All right? And then to be the first one, I had a little granddaughter, man. Here she was. She wasn't three years old and all her teeth was gone. All of them. I'm saying three... You got the little milk teeth in, they're all rotten now. You know why? Because somebody was giving her what she wanted. When she wanted. Do you think God's going to be that crazy with you? No. He knows that number one, he give you all that, and that all they're going to do is rotten your attitude, rotten your disposition. Because can't nobody get along with you because you're just eating your sweet stuff all the time. Mm. So what he does, he balances it out. You will have some good days and you have some better days. Because <laughs> sometimes the good days ain't so good. <laughs> but God knows. Because he knows that if you're not believing in your heart, that's where God's trying to bring you to, to your ultimate test 
that when you finally say, well, Job could say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. My faith has got to get me there. I've got to come to a place where no matter what, all hell breaks loose, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, I'm going to trust him in everything. That's what old, old Job came to the final conclusion. Though you slay me, I'm going to trust you though. And see, trust goes beyond. Sometimes even faith should lead me to trust. And I think sometimes when we have faith, sometimes we think it is trust, but really the ultimate goal, you may be believing, but God is trying to bring you farther than just believing. He wants you to really trust him. And that's the hard part. But anyway, so we talked about forging the faith. We talked about how uh, God brought the Israelite through the wilderness. What, why did he do that? Why didn't he just take and put them over into the promised land 11 days away? Because he knew what was in their heart. He knows that just because they came out of Egypt don't mean that they are sanctified and holy and all that kind of stuff. They got to learn some things. You know, the Bible said Jesus learned how to be a son through the things he what? Rejoiced over? Huh? Danced over? Yeah, see, we, we learn church by the things we dance about. But he's not teaching you church. He didn't come to teach you about church. He came that you might know him. And when you know him, then you begin to realize what church is. Because without him, you don't know what church is because, first of all, you're going to think it's just a building. And when all the time there's not a building built that could contain it. And what he chose to do, now this is what really gets me. He could have had anybody, gave somebody some wisdom to build this elaborate structure. And it could have been the most beautiful thing in the world because when you go back and look at the old tabernacle of Moses, man, them boys had some money in it. I mean, it had some gold stuff, a lot of gold. And it looked probably pretty good, but you know what? God never was pleased. Solomon built one. It was so elaborate, they didn't even have a hammer in the city. It came, fitted together when they got it together. Had overlaid gold, all kinds of gold, all kinds of stuff. And yet, it wasn't good enough for God. Did you realize that? They call it the house of God, but it never was good enough for God. Jesus came, he didn't spend calling no time in that temple. He showed up I, a couple of times at the temple. Every time he showed up, those things got kind of reckless. Seemed like he was trying to tear the house up instead of build the house. But see, he wasn't trying to build that kind of house. That's why the Bible tells you that you are alive as stones. He's fitted you together. He fitted his people together that he may be a habitation in those people. He called you his tabernacle, his temple. Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Knowing that, and then when you know that your body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost, guess what the Lord is? The Lord is the Lord over his own sanctuary. So if my body is his temple, then this is where God is. That's where God functions. If I went back and looked at the old covenant, the old tabernacle, when he makes me his temple, I become his light, his bread, his praise, his glory, all the things that he is. That's why he said, as he is, so are we in this present world. But Christians, we got to get the veil off your mind to realize that that's glory to be seen. Egypt had gotten in their hearts so deep is that they, no matter how much God worked with them, took them through all kind of tests. Every test is to help you get one another step in faith. 
Have you ever noticed, especially some of us, maybe, well, I just speak for myself. I used to have the same struggles all the time because I reacted to the test the wrong way. Every time the test came around, I reacted wrong. And so I didn't pass. How many of you know God don't grade on the curve? <laughs> How many of you know you can't go to the next step till you pass the test? And that test will keep showing up. May not the same person, may not even look like the same thing, but until I pass that test, I can't take another step. All I'm doing is like they're doing. When you keep flunking the test, you keep going around the same mountain. Mm -mm. The same, you got to keep going around that mountain. Because in order for you to get where God wants you to be, you got to have enough faith to step where God wants you to step. And as much as you would like not to complain, but the moment things outside of you get the best of you, you're going to complain about them. And God hates. Hello? I don't think people believe that. God hates murmurs. And complainers, you know how you know who died more. Did you think? Did you think he killed more adulterers than he did complainers? Do you think he killed more thieves than he did complainers? No, the most people God ever got rid of was complainers and murmurs. A whole generation died in the wilderness because they couldn't quit murmuring and complaining. How many people believe that God has everything under control? Now, I'm not, I don't want you to believe that with your head. That's one of those things you got to believe in your heart. Because if your head is just telling you that, then the first thing you're going to do is go out and see something and then try to make a judgment on it because you don't think God understands and knows what's going on. You're going to get down and pray and say, God, you don't know what I'm going through. Then you're telling God he's stupid. If he's all wise, you, do you honestly think he don't see you? You think he don't know what you're going through? After he has bore all of your pain and everything else you could ever bear, he bore it all for you and you tell me he don't know what you're going through? No, no. So I don't have a complaint. You cannot, that's why as a Christian, the first thing out your mouth should be thank you, Jesus. Well, I, I, have, I find it hard to thank Jesus for something like that. Well, you, you, you may find it hard to thank him, but I tell you what, if you keep thanking him, eventually you're going to realize one thing the best Aaron could have done was say, thank you, Jesus. I, I believe that what you have allowed is right. I know that it's good. But anyway, the forging of faith was that God had to get rid of their superstition. I didn't feel good in God until I was able to step on the crack and walk on the left. Here we go. And break a mirror. <laughs> I remember one time I broke a mirror. Somebody said, oh, man, you got seven years of bad luck. Don't ever have a car wrecked then. And your mirrors get tore up. But, you know, we laughing, but be honest with you. We have a lot of underlying superstitious stuff. You know, it, it, I ain't lying. It, it used to be out with conscience. They said, don't, don't, don't. Man, them old people say, don't walk on it. Don't step on that crack. Man, have you jumping all over the place? We have a ladder on the sidewalk. Don't walk on that ladder. Don't walk on that ladder. You bad luck. Black cat run across their walk seven blocks out the way because the black cat. I almost believed that until the black cat walked out in front of my car. <laughs> then I found out who had the bad luck. It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, it's very superstitious. There's nobody more superstitious than a fisherman. 
because as a fisherman, the sun, the moon, certain socks. So I had certain things I wore to fishing. Yeah. Fishing shoes. You know what I'm saying? Because when I caught that big fish, I had these on. <laughs> I know y'all laughing, but I'm telling you. No, no, I'm just saying, when you had it, you, you, you mess around and get some stuff working for you when you started fishing. Yep. You know, I had the little rubber duck when I went fishing that day, caught that big fish. Guess what? The rubber duck riding with me. Huh? Yeah. Because that's why Jesus, that's why he called them fishermen. See, he knew that superstition. What did they say when they seen him walking on the water? Mm -mm. Now they've been walking with him for three and a half, almost three and a half years. They seen him walking on the water. First thing they thought, uh oh, one of them seagulls. <laughs> Pete stood up a little while and looked, I don't know. Kind of looked like Jesus, man. The rest of them probably was down there under. Because you don't want to catch no spirit out on the sea because you can't outrun it. <laughs> Pete finally says, you know what? If it be you, Lord, if, if it be you, I'm sure he was shook then. Because he didn't recognize it. Because if he would have recognized it, he would have said, Jesus. But he said, if it be you, Lord, tell me it is you. Because if it's not you, I'm going down with the rest of them. And right now, the only way you're going to convince me is you bid me to come. And he said, come. Now, he's still scared. You know what I'm saying? How many of y'all going to step? I mean, the boat is kind of making you sick. Because if you ever been in a storm on a boat, you, I can tell you right now, all your breakfast and supper is probably going to come up. <laughs> and that thing was jumping, and, and then he's telling him, not only the, the boat is bad, but it's not that bad. I mean, at least you got some foundation. You know, you got something to hold on to. And here comes the Lord saying, come. And you're looking down. Man, I ain't, ain't going to lie to you. You got to know it's Jesus when you step off that boat. Yes. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Now, you ain't never seen him do this before. Matter of fact, you ain't never seen nobody do that. And he's telling you to come. <laughs> you know what we're going to be telling Jesus? Why don't you come over here? <laughs> Why don't you come over here and get me? See, right? You see me in the storm, come over here and get me. But Jesus said, no, I want you to step out the boat. Well, stepping out the boat looks worse than being on the boat. How many times have we lived in a bad situation and God will speak to us to get, make it better, but what he's talking about make it look better looks worse. He says, step out. <laughs> you got me mixed up. <laughs> huh? No, but here he's saying, step out of this boat. See, you're familiar with fighting your own battles. You're familiar with fighting your own storm. You're familiar with how to straighten some stuff out as much as you can. But he's saying, no, I want to show you something different. Yes. Your faith needs to let you walk on my word now. I said, come, can you, can you step on that? And he said he did. But no sooner as he get out of here, you know how in your mind start playing tricks with you? Yeah. Have you ever started walking? Have you ever tried to step out of a situation and, and, and you're doing good and all of a sudden you realize, you know, I'm out here in no man's land. What, what business do I have out here? And immediately he gets out here, what his eyes do? How many times 
have you and I. We were doing good, but it was just two surprises. Ain't no way I should be where I am. And he took his eyes off Jesus. And what happened to him? Not only was he sinking, but he was sinking without the boat. At least if you were sinking in the boat, you had the boat to hold on to. And so he says, but then he realized his famous words, Jesus, save me. There are times when God wants to hear you say that. Some of us like to play it safe, right? It's one of my messages from Noel. Just because you feel safe don't mean that you're safe. We can live in a safe place without living in a safe place. On the boat, they were safe. But it was out there where nothing was, they were saved. Yeah. We want to get, we love to have those places. How you doing? Places where we feel safe. But God ain't trying to keep you safe. He wants you to be saved. And you don't know what saved is until so you go to the Savior. You don't know what you need to be saved from until you call upon his name. You won't know what salvation is until you get in that place where there's no longer anything under your feet, anything that you can control. They still have a little control over that boat. But when you get out there on his word, you don't have no control over his word. None. Oh, praise God. So, Faith makes the way. Everybody say that. Faith makes the way. Yeah. Sometimes sometime we're trying to make it the way. But faith is what makes the way. Matter of fact, faith is not following somebody else's route or route. Faith is already making a route. Your, matter of fact, the Bible tells you the footsteps are made by the righteous man. No, that's not what it said, did it? It says they're ordered by God. That means that, see, when they came to the Red Sea, you remember how they reacted? They came to the Red Sea and they, 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 they come to a standstill because they didn't feel like they'd go forward, nor could they go back because what behind them was kind of rough too. But what in front of them was even worse because evidently they weren't swimmers. They didn't have boat builders. Here God is sending you go forward and you're looking at what's in front of you and you say, well, I can't go back. And that's where most people live today. We can't go back, but yet we can't go forward. What's behind us is scary. But what's in front of us is even scarier. What would happen if I keep going? Because, see, God's faith operates like this. It doesn't operate. Faith doesn't wait on you. But when God speaks, you've got to step when God speaks. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. The most impossible thing you ever see. East wind blew. That water came up on both sides. I can't even picture that in my mind. And once again, he's asking you to step in something that's more scarier than what you've been in. Amen. Now, how many of y'all, I know, I know we all watched the Ten Commandments with Charleston Heston. Anybody ain't seen that? At least one time in your life? Anna, you ever see that picture? Ten Commandments? Oh, no. I thought Moses was Charles and Hester. Every time I picture Moses, I see Charles and Hester. That's who I pictured Moses to be. But <laughs> here he is, lifting that rod. Water's coming up. Both sides. Now I know in our minds, 
Oh, I see it on the movie. It really looked cool. It did. It looked real cool. But in all reality, today, if you had to do that, how many would y'all be standing back? Hmm. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think so. I ain't walking. Suppose that water come down. Is that what you're going to be thinking? Because you got water on both sides. Now I'm let the fish sit there looking at you. And you, he's telling you to go through this thing, and you're trying to figure out, wait. God, you can, you can give us better transportation than this, I know. Why didn't you build a boat like you gave Noah so we could all float across? But instead, he wanted them to walk through what they thought was impossible. Faith is about accomplishing, walking through the impossibilities. There is nothing impossible with God to them that believe. Impossibilities are places of miracles. Every time there was a place of impossibility, there was always a miracle because God bought them there. God could let Abraham have babies when he was teenagers. But he didn't. You know what he done? He waited until it was impossible for conception. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a happy, wouldn't that be a happy day for some of y'all? A hundred years old. Going to St. Mary's? What ward you going to? I'm going to the OB ward. Can you see that? No. How many of y'all be mad at God if he, <laughs> for such a miracle? <laughs> I can't believe God will. I'm too old for this. Have you ever thought age is but a number? If God decide that he want to wait a hundred years. Now don't get me wrong. Do not get me wrong. That is not my prayer. <laughs> that is not my prayer at all. I don't, I, don't, I don't even desire to have that kind of miracle. But if God did give me that miracle, I knew it was God. <laughs> right? Okay, so faith makes a way. And one of the things that we need to understand, again, what happens when we start murmuring and complaining? What happens? See, they, there are consequences for everything. When you start complaining, you allow, you release the destroyers in your life to destroy the thing that God was building for you. Do you understand that? That's what complaining does. Because it's, it's not God's voice you're hearing to make you complain. Matter of fact, when they started complaining, remember what happened? The Lord allowed the snakes. He released the serpents. And matter of fact, everybody that was complaining was getting bit. And then he wanted to tell them a lesson. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you get bit by the snake since you're complaining so much. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn around and look like a serpent to you so you can call upon me and I'm going to deliver you. Because they made a serpent out of golden calf and hung it up and everyone that got bit from complaining looked and got delivered. Some of y'all need a look. <laughs> the destroyer has been... He, you have released the destroy in your life. God doesn't come to take away from you. He come to give to you. God is not a taker. He's a giver. I come that you might have life. And most people thought he came that you might make a living. Making a living ain't life. All right? Most people have not enjoyed life because they don't know what life is. We're in a system where people tell you your life consists of what you got. 
People judge you by what you don't have or do have. And we have spent our whole life trying to build a life that God has given us a life that we won't even accept. I'm not, he's not just trying to give you mediocre, average life. I come that you might have life and that life more abundant. That should not be anybody in the whole wide world have more peace than the child of God. That should not be anybody in the whole wide world that doesn't have as much love as the people of God. Why? It's abundant life. No one in, the, in this world should have more peace, joy, love, righteous, happiness. We don't even have a right to be unhappy. Uh-oh. Mm. I said the wrong thing. What do you mean? I'll tell you what I mean. Because happiness is a choice. Only body can make you unhappy is you. And if somebody else is making you unhappy, it's because you allowed somebody to take control of your life. Huh? I choose to be happy. I wake up every morning happy. Now you say, well, brother, do anybody ever get on your nerves? Sure do. <laughs> but does that stop me from being happy? No. I'm still happy. I'm going to live in peace. You know why? Because I'm only going to let in my life what genders to peace. If it don't bring peace, I don't have nothing to do with it. Let it go. We're not fighting to get peace. We have peace. So let the peace of God rule. Everybody said rule. You know, you know what that word really means? It really means that the peace of God becomes the umpire. He's calling the balls and strikes. And you got to learn in your life is that let, if you will make choices in the confines of peace, you can already know whether or not you should do it just by what peace you're going to have about it. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You know, I told y'all, let me tell you this again. Some of y'all didn't hear it the first time. I remember one time I thought I was going to be feeling real good and happy about myself because I seen this. What year was that? I don't know, but it was one of them cars I'd always wanted. And they had one out there on the lot. And I said, man, I'm getting that car. Boy, if I got that car, I wanted to take a vacation. i n I never forget, I want to get that car so bad. Man, I drove out there. I rolled around. You know, you know how we pray about things? I prayed about it. I felt like I got the okay because I liked it. <laughs> I never forget driving on that lot. Got in there, man. That guy said, uh, uh, "I said, how much you want for that car? We, I, bring me your bottom price." He said, "Well, he said, uh, okay." But I then looked at the car. You, you know, sometimes we get so blinded by our own desires that we can't even see even what God's trying to show you. The guy lifted up the hood. I should have known something. The alternator was new. Everything under there was new. The radiator was new. It didn't dawn on me. This car has been wrecked. But I couldn't see that. Matter of fact, when the man came, he was trying to get some finances. The guy came back and said, well, he didn't, we didn't get it there. I said, well, I, I kept saying that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I said, the devil trying to keep me from my blessing. Mm -hmm. Any of y'all ever said that? Yeah, he's trying to keep me from my blessing. I stayed past the quitting time. Got that car, was just as happy. Couldn't wait because I was going on vacation. Oh. I thought me and my wife were going to get a divorce that time. About that car. That was one of the worst deals. I'm, I'm riding down the road and the cruise control cable broke. So now I got to drive this thing. The air condition broke. My wife, oh, I'm hot. Don't you think I'm hot too? <laughs> <laughs> you know that? Yeah. Yeah, I ain't going to lie. But God was so good to me. 
Because that was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made, trying to override. I try to make God work according to my emotions. I had no peace nowhere about that car. I got it if I'd have just listened to God. But because I had never exercised, never understood, God doesn't send thunder and lightning to say no. Sometimes it's just an uneasiness. I don't have peace in it. If you don't have peace in it, don't mess with it. It's real simple. Well, you know, and then and they'll say, well, you know, God trying to keep something from you. When God give you something, you're going to have peace in it. You know, I'd rather have peace in a tent than to, than to have a whole lot of hell in a mansion. Praise God. But we release that destroyer. When you complain and murmur, you release the destroyer to do in your life whatever he sees fit to do. Because God cannot work when you're murmuring and complaining because you're showing a lack of trust and a lack of confidence in God. If God says all things, come on. I know you saying, you know, all things work together for the good to who now? Wait, wait, wait. That's where we got to stop. We got to stop right there. Right there. Because you ain't going to believe all things work together for the good unless you love God. All right? And it all works like that if you do love God. But all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the call according to his or yours. We thought it was ours. Then. That's where we get messed up at. Because in all things ain't working together for my purpose. Is it? It's his purpose that all things are working together for the good of them that love it. He had a purpose in that. God has a purpose in your life. And your purpose is not always his purpose, but his purpose will always be his purpose. Why do some, why does Job lose all his kids? Why? Because God had a purpose. Do you think Job saw that at the beginning? Many of us today, we've had a lot of things happen to us in this life. And we, didn't, we don't see how that's going to work out for the good. We don't, we don't have no understanding how the purpose of God is going to be served because of that. That was Joseph went to prison. Man, it's kind of hard to be thinking that there's a purpose behind that, other than the fact that I'm locked down. I've been to jail before. I did not see no purpose in that. <laughs> but now that I've gotten past that, I look back, I see the purpose in that. <laughs> there are things about your life today that you would not, and when you looked at it, when it happened, you saw no purpose in it whatsoever. You could not understand why this is happening to me. But as you begin to grow and begin to go, you look back and realize, you know, there was no, I didn't see a purpose then, but now I know why God allowed me to be able to go through that. Why? Some of you don't even have a testimony because you aborted everything God would have given you to be one. Every one of them. Instead of going on through, realize one thing, this is going to work to your good. Not just to your good. Paul said it like this, my tribulation has been your consolation. I wish my kids could have heard everything I told them, but they didn't. But it had a purpose. But later on in life, you know what he done? He come back and said, yeah, Dad, I see now. I wish you could have saw when I told him. <laughs> he missed it, like I missed it. But see, everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Amen. Don't, don't put it in no category. Don't put no parentheses around your troubles because everything you have went through and everything you're going to go through has purpose to it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You can't know what hunger is until you've been hungry. See, you wouldn't understand. A lot of people don't understand people. They don't understand people because they haven't been where people are. It was the prophet Ezekiel that got heated in his spirit because he looked out at the people of Israel. He could not understand how 
how they were acting and all the things they were going through. And he began, you know, when you ain't been there, you can preach hard against those people. Right? That's why when Jesus came, he didn't hang out in the church. He hung out with people that the church would not accept. Huh? He, he didn't hang out in the, he, he wasn't even talking to the bishop. He was not talking to the people in the temple. The people he hung out with, as a matter of fact, the Bible said his, his, this is a testimony, the reputation he had. He was a friend of the sinners. He hung out with them because the church would not even have them. Ezekiel got heated until God gave him a new experience. Some people wonder why I took my hair off my head. I didn't want God picking me up like he did Ezekiel by the hair of the head and sitting him down. I keep my head kind of greased a little bit so his hand might slip. <laughs> Me and Brother Paul in the same boat, see? He read that same scripture. <laughs> but Ezekiel got heated in the spirit. He looked out, you know, you know how we say, I can't believe they living like that. I can't. I don't know, I don't know why you can't believe it. Some of us lived the same way before God got a hold of us. But we get saved, we can't see how they're doing it. But you didn't know why God allowed you to live like that. See, it's kind of hard to talk to a drug addict if you ain't never had drugs. Hmm? You can't talk to alcoholics if you've never been one. So you've been one, but then we get in church and think that, that those things that he bought me out of, you know, I don't ever want to talk about them again. It might be the reason why God let you go through that because he might need you to talk about it again. Everybody's looking for a way out. But I don't want somebody going to college and reading a book and then tell me how to get out of something they ain't never been in. I don't like free advice from people that ain't never lived a life. If you're going to tell me something about life, be honest with me. Let me know where you've been so I can relate to where you've been. Because most things we try to do, oh, you know, we way up here. Oh, thank God I ain't like them guys. Ezekiel, I'm going to pick you up by your hair. The Bible says he set him down right in the middle. He's sitting down in the middle and probably wondering, what am I doing in here? But if you'll notice when you go back and read that story, after God set him down in the midst of the people, his whole ministry changed after that. Before he ever sat with them, he was sitting there down on them. Some of us ain't set in places we need to set so we can know how people really are feeling and what people are really going through. We got this facade that we put on like everything is hunky-dory and everything is good. No, let me say, we are not exempt. There's no Christian exempt from anything. We are not exempt from troubles. We are not exempt from problems. We will have them. In this life, man is born of woman, have a few days, and man, them days is full. If you counted your troubles, you would count a bunch of them. But here we are. We have this concept because our faith has not been developed. And the first time adversity comes, we forget who we believe in. We think God can bring us out of Egypt but he can't take us into his promise. We have a problem coming out, but we have a problem going in. Hmm? That's our problem today. It's not about coming out. Yeah, we came out, but have we went into place? That's why most of the time people can always tell you what you can't do, but they can't tell you what you can do. Isn't it strange? We've been in church for 50 years, and someone would ask you about God. What, what, what can you do in God? Well, we can go to church and we can sing, get a good choir. Do you honestly think that's all God wants to save you for? So you can learn the songs in a songbook? And so you can get in here and shout to each other and tell how good God is, but when you get out your mouth, you got locked up. You aren't able to tell anybody what, what you can do. When he says joy, unspeakable, Maybe that's why you ain't talking. You got too much joy. I got to let you go, though. <laughs> I didn't get to my lesson this morning, but don't worry about that. We'll be back. Any question, though, before I 
close this out. Everybody good? All right. Round two. <laughs>